Uh, turn with me tonight to uh, the book of Genesis again. The book of Genesis, and we're going to read chapter 41. Chapter 41. And we're just coming to the very end of the chapter. We're going to start reading at verse 53. And read a little into chapter 42. So Genesis chapter 41 and reading from verse 53. And the seven years of plenty as that was in the land of Egypt were ended. The seven years of dearth began to come according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands. But in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses, <laughs> And sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in all lands. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do you look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither, and buy for us from thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, Lest peradventure mischief befall him. The sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? They said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. They said unto him, Nay, my lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the son of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, our youngest this day is with our father, and one is not. And Joseph said unto them, that it is that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Hereby ye shall be proved by the life of Pharaoh. Ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother. Ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh surely ye are spies. And he put them all together into ward, Three days. And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye carry corn for the famine of your houses. But bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 20. We'd love to read on the rest of the chapter, but uh, the reading would be too long. Uh, may God stand with his own approval and blessing these words that we have read. Uh, let's just wait upon the Lord for a little moment's prayer as we open our Bible 
And let's pray the Lord will come and speak to us. Lord, we thank thee that it's possible for us to hear from heaven. We're glad we can get a word from thyself. We've been taken up tonight again with the voice of the Lord. I heard the voice of Jesus say, and we say to thee tonight again, come by us, Lord. Come, come by us. Come and speak, Lord. Come and open our ears. Lord, let our testimony be, mine ear hast thou opened. O oh God, we need thee in these days, not only to come and presence thyself with us, not only to manifest thy power, but we need thee to speak to us. You know the state and condition of our hearts and minds. You know how fearful we really are for ourselves, for our families, and for our future. And Lord, we seek of thee. We believe thou hast a right way for us, a right way for our children, a right way for our substance, a right way for ourselves, a right way for the work of God. And we just commit ourselves to thee. We pray you'll come, Lord, and put your hand upon us. We pray that thou will say to us, this is the way, walk ye in it. Lord, we don't want to take a step without thee. We think of Moses' cry, if thy presence go not with us, carry us not up hence. And Lord, we fear, we fear moving without the presence of God. And we cry to thee, Lord, that you'll put your hand upon us. We know the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And O oh God, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. And we rejoice in that. But we know the stops of the Lord are upon us as well. Lord, without thee, we, we cry that thou will indeed just abide with us. O oh Lord, we, we leave ourselves at thy face. We cry to thee at this hour that thou will have mercy upon us and that we'll know what it is for thee to speak. We just commit thy word now to thyself. We thank you for the reading of it. We're glad we have a faithful and reliable translation in the authorized version of the Holy Scriptures. We thank thee, Lord, for the men of old that laid down their blood that we might have this faithful translation. And, O oh God, we just pray to thee that we'll be forever taken up in our minds with thy word that thou hast magnified even above all thy holy name. Help us to count every word as pure and every word as precious. And, O oh God, all your promises and precepts, as we, Lord, read them and meditate upon them, let them be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Lord, just bless us now and ask thee to shut us in with thee. Do us good at this hour, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Now, my text tonight is taken from Genesis chapter 41 and verses 56 and verse 57. And my subject this evening is Joseph and the opening of all the storehouses. Joseph, having been released from prison, where he'd spent at least 13 years on a false charge, now stood before Pharaoh. Pharaoh rehearsed to Joseph two strange dreams that he had during the night. He requested from him an interpretation of them. Joseph, by the grace and wisdom of God, told Pharaoh, your dreams are really one. They contain one central message, one plain interpretation. There's to be seven years of plenty in Egypt. That's represented by the seven fat cows and the seven good ears of corn. Then there's to be seven years of poverty in Egypt. That's represented, Pharaoh, by the lean cows and the thin ears of corn. And during this period, the rain will be withheld. The ground will yield no crops. There'll be a very true and deep famine and hunger and all of Egypt, Pharaoh was going to be affected, including the lands that surround the Egyptians' border. Joseph then advised Pharaoh to seek out a man who was wise and discreet to take up at least one-fifth of the bumper harvest during the seven years of plenty and lay them up in stores against the seven years of famine that is going to come so that the land of Egypt perish not throughout the famine period. Having listened to Joseph's interpretation of his dreams and having heard this wise advice, Pharaoh was overwhelmed. He was filled with joy and he said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this? A man in whom the Spirit of God is. So Joseph was appointed to uh, the role and office of prime minister over the whole land of Egypt. Chapter 41, verse 41. 
he was appointed second in command over all of Egypt. Joseph traveled the length and breadth of the land. Storehouses were built. Corn was stored out of the reserves of the bumper harvest. In fact, one-fifth of the entire crop year and year was put into storage. Listen to chapter 41, verse 49. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering, for it was without number. Then the seven years of plenty Give way to the seven years of poverty. The famine began to bite. We were told in the Bible that it was sore. And that means it was very grievous. It affected all of Egypt. It affected the country surrounding Egypt. And soon the Egyptians began to complain. They cried out to Pharaoh. And he instructed them, as we learned last week, go to Joseph and whatsoever he saith to you, do. We read in verse 46, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. In verse 57, we're told, and all countries came into Egypt to Joseph to buy corn. This included the family of Jacob. That brings us into chapter 42. You see, old Jacob knew, according to verse 2, that his own family was facing and staring death in the face. He had heard there was corn in Egypt. There was a supply available that could sustain them in the hour of need and trouble. He knew there was only one answer to this need, and that was to go to the one who could supply their need. And that's what he did. Now, Joseph is a remarkable type of the Lord Jesus in all of the Bible. Reformed and biblical scholars and commentators tell us that there's at least about 101 distinct foreshadowings of Jesus Christ in the life of Joseph. For example, listen to me carefully, Joseph was the beloved son of his father, chapter 37 and 3. In like manner, God the Father said of Jesus Christ at least two times, transfiguration and his baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Here's another example. Joseph was hated by his own kith and kin. We read of the Lord Jesus in the New Testament, John 15, 25. They hated me without a cause. Joseph was sent on a mission by his father to seek the good and welfare of his brethren. The Lord Jesus was sent on a mission of mercy by his father. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, I could go on and on and on. Joseph was stripped of his garments. So was the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph was sold for a sum of silver. So was the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph was betrayed by one close to him. So was the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph was numbered with the transgressors. So was the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, out of all the characters in the Bible, There's no record of any sin or scandal that can be attributed to Joseph. I'm not saying that Joseph wasn't a sinner. I'm not saying that he didn't sin. But there's no record of Joseph sinning in the whole of Genesis. You see, Joseph in that sense is a a type of the sinless and impeccable life of the Lord Jesus. And here's another type. See, all these are... Things in the life of Joseph, they're distant foreshadowings of Christ. Joseph was brought out of prison. The Lord Jesus was brought out of the prison house of death. Here's another one. Joseph was not only brought out of prison, but he was brought into an exalted position from the prison to the palace. And the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead and exalted to the right hand of God. And Joseph became the saviour of the world, at least physically at that time. And the Lord Jesus is called in the Bible, many references, the saviour of the world. And he alone, of course, can meet the need of hungry sinners. And Joseph opened up all the storehouses of Egypt. And in like manner, I believe the Lord Jesus has a storehouse of grace. He's got a supply for needy souls. It's open for all comers. It's open at all hours. And if you come in sincerity and in truth, and you come with a need, and you request the need to be met, then the heavenly Joseph 
will meet your need. I, I want us to think of verse 56. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. Think of four things very quickly. The origin of the supply. And Joseph opened all the storehouses. You see, here's a striking fact. A fact that was affecting every Egyptian. A fact that was affecting Jacob and his own family. We, we read here on a number of occasions, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. Look at verse 57, because that the famine was so sore in all lands. The famine was so sore that the people faced death and starvation. Look at verse, 40, uh, verse 2 in chapter 42. Speaking of Jacob, and he said, Behold, I've heard that there's corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. You see, they had no corn of their own. They had no means of providing corn or bread for themselves. They had nothing to meet their own need. They were empty-handed. Their resources were finished. They, they had nothing to meet their own need. And old Jacob, well, he hears like many others, there's corn in Egypt. And he commands his sons to go down to Egypt and buy corn. And he says that we may live and not die. You see, literally, there's a source of supply in Egypt. There's an open storehouse. And you boys need to go down there and get some grain for us. And when I think of that, I think of the heavenly Joseph. You see, we too are a needy people, aren't we? Personally, we stand in need of grace to go on, grace to persevere, grace to pray, grace to read the Bible and get a word from God, grace to speak up for Christ when opportunity arises, grace to stand fast in the liberty where with Christ has made us free, grace to know more of him, grace to live and work with him. Grace to withstand temptation. Grace to keep on going so that we'll not quit in Christ and turn away from him. Grace to face trials and troubles. Aren't we invited to the throne of grace? Let us therefore, in light of the fact that we have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, that's passed into the heavens, therefore, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, we need grace personally every day. What about paternally? All of us have family needs. All families have problems. They have particular dilemmas. They stand at times in need of help. And to whom can we go to? We can go to the heavenly Joseph. And we can bring our paternal needs and leave them at thy, his feet and ask them for grace. Think about congregational needs. We need to see the Lord work here, don't we? We need to see a move of the Holy Spirit. We need to see souls saved. We, we, we need and long for a breath of revival. We want the work of God built up. We need help to go forward together. We need the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We need help to, to learn how the Lord wants us to treat each other. We need help financially. We have no resources of our own to meet the need. We, we can't create an anxious thought. We can't force souls to, to be saved. We can't drag people into the meetings against their will. We have limited resources, even though we sacrifice to the Lord and to the Lord's cause. See, we're a needy people, aren't we? I am denominationally, we're a needy people. We're thinking of the free church. Where is our hope of survival? Save in thy life-giving breath, the hymn writer says. Is there a solution to what we face and what we're going through at this time? Is there really a future for the free church? Dr. Cook stressed that Thursday week ago in Arma, and he said, yes, there is. And I believe there is. I don't believe God is finished with us. Do you know why? 
Because there's an origin of supply. There's a storehouse of heavenly grace. And it's full. Aye, and everything in it's free. And you know the best news of all? It's available to us. And it's there to meet our need. And we can avail ourselves of such supply. It's open to all who come. I I was thinking there's a television program. I I can't remember. It's many years since I saw it. It used to be Open All Hours. And it was was a sort of a a, a sitcom. Uh, I think one of the people that was in it was Ronnie Barker. He, he, He may be dead now. But I was thinking, Joseph opening the storehouses. And I was thinking, not only is it open to all comers, Egyptians and others. But it's open all hours, day or night. Let's think of the origin of supply. And Joseph opened all the storehouses. And the Lord Jesus has opened the storehouse of grace for needy sinners to meet our need personally, to meet the need of our families, to meet the need of our churches, to meet the need of our denomination, to meet the need of the land. I want you to think secondly, not only of the origin of the supply, but I want you to think of the oligarch of the supply. The oligarch is just the governor. Uh, It says in verse 6, and Joseph was the governor over the land. The oligarch was Joseph. And you see, the need was supplied by one who loved them. I want you to think of this. Joseph's ten, or or Jacob's ten sons, Joseph's ten brothers, going into Egypt. They're leaving Canaan and they're going into a different land, a foreign state. And they're thinking we're going to meet a stern Egyptian. There's going to be an unfriendly face. No favor is going to be shown to us. There's no advantages will be manifest to us. They're thinking this is simply a business transaction. If you count in the reading of the early chapter, many times the word buy was mentioned. They just wanted to go and buy bread. Look at verse 7 of chapter 42. And Joseph saw his brethren and he knew them. In other words, he recognized them. You've got to remember he left them or they left. They sold them when he was 17. He's now about 40 years of age, somewhere between 37 and 40, 27 years later. And he saw them and he knew them. It says again in verse 8, and Joseph knew his brothers, brethren, but they knew him not. Think, think of this. They had sold him as a slave and now he's the sovereign. They're bowing the knee to him. They branded him a schemer And now he's a supplier of their need. He was one to whom they showed no mercy. He was one over whom they shed no tears. One whom they hated and despised. Remember how they threw him into a pit? And now he was going to be their saviour in supplying their need. And Joseph knew them. I think that's significant. Come with me to verse 25 of chapter 42. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. Joseph didn't return their evil for evil. He didn't say, well, revenge is sweet. He wasn't full of bitterness or hatred toward them. Joseph commanded to fill their sacks. He restored every man's money. He made provision for the way. Why did he do it? I believe it was because he really loved them. He saw them. He knew them. He loved them. He had a heart of compassion. He was moved to act toward them out of love. Their need was supplied by one who loved them. Now think of the Lord Jesus. Jeremiah 33 and 1. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Listen again to the Apostle John in John chapter 4. And he makes this tremendous statement in John chapter 4, uh, verses 
uh, 9. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. The Lord Jesus is able to meet our need out of love. But God commended his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice something else. The need was not only supplied by one who loved them, but the need was supplied by one in whom the Spirit of God is. Think of what Pharaoh said. Can we find such an one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Literally, what he was saying to his servants was, is there any one like this in the whole of the world? Is there anyone like this alive in the earth? There's none like this man. This man's unique. We, we, we need this man in charge. Think of the Lord Jesus. The heavenly Joseph, the Spirit of God was given to him without measure. And when we think of the Lord Jesus, think of his worth for a moment. Remember before Pilate? Well, ask Pilate's opinion. I find no fault in this man. The thief on the cross said, this man hath done nothing amiss. Pilate's wife in a dream, trouble came and said, have nothing to do with this just man. The, the centurion said, truly, this man is the son of God. Here's a, a perfect, unique savior who is able to supply our need. The second person of the Holy Trinity, God in the flesh, and yet bone of our bone, one who represents God and man, a, a, a mediator between God and man. Think of his words. John 7, Pharisees sent men to find fault with Christ. And what was their verdict when they heard him? Never man spake like this man. I think of the Lord Jesus. He stood before men and his disciples, and he said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. On another occasion, he said, I'm the bread of life. He said, on another occasion, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. I told you on Saturday morning, we were in Ballygown listening to Keith Shields give his testimony. He said him and his wife went to buy a house, and while he was there, he noticed a plaque in a pool room and some other uh, gaming devices the plaque in the wall says, if there's no beer in heaven, I don't want to go there. And I want to tell you, there's no beer in heaven. I, and there's no beer in hell either. There's not even a drop of water <coughs> to dip the <coughs> cool, or, or, or to, a drop of water to, to, to uh, cool the torment of your tongue. Because Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He's got a life-giving supply. He's the source of satisfaction. Think of his work. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And I think of Joseph. You see, Joseph had a work to do. Joseph could supply the need of the Egyptians and Jacob and his family and many other families only on the basis of a finished work. How could Joseph open the storehouses in Egypt? How could there be food in Egypt? This was a time of famine. The answer was because before the famine, there was a time of preparation. There was a time of ingathering. In the years of plenty, seven years of plenty, there was a laying up on store, a, a, a grain a, a left numbering because it was as large as the sand in the sea. Joseph stored food for the years of famine to come. He was a man of wisdom, a man whom God had set apart, a man whom God had sent forth to do a work, a man who was full of zeal. And they were only partaking of a work that was already finished. He just opened the storehouses and supplied their need. You think of the provision of the cross. You think of all that's freely given in Jesus Christ. Remember what we read there in the book of Romans? Speaking of the Lord Jesus in Romans chapter 8, and verse 32, the apostle makes a tremendous statement that this is what he says. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for his all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Freely give us all things. You see, he draws us to the cross. 
He draws us to Calvary. Come with me, visit Calvary. We sang that deliberately today. Because if we want a blessing, let's look to Calvary. Let's look to the finished work. The finished work of Christ on the cross is our guarantee of the Lord's provision. Because the Lord always provides for us and supplies our need on the basis of the finished work. On the basis of the blood sacrifice. During the reign of Nicholas I, the Russian Tsar, he used to disguise himself and walk among his troops and listen to what they were saying and see what they were doing. He went into this soldier's tent on one occasion. The soldier was asleep. He noticed a revolver sitting. He picked it up. He noticed it was ready for firing. He also noticed as he lifted up the revolver, there was a sheet of paper. He looked at the sheet of paper and had loads of debt on it. And in the bottom, written in pen, was who is sufficient to pay my debt. He realized this young soldier is going to commit suicide in my tent. So what he did was, he signed his name, Nicholas, below the question. And he left the tent. Sometime later, the young man woke up. He took the gun, he was about to commit suicide. And he just looked at the paper, and to his astonishment, he saw a word at it that he hadn't penned. Nicholas! And he realized the czar had been in the tent. And do you know, later that evening, a bag of money was deposited to that young man with instructions to pay off his debt. And he was told that he could then repay the czar by a life of faithful service as a soldier. And his life was saved. We were singing, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it. White as snow. You see, there's a welcome at the cross because it's on the basis of a finished work that our need is supplied. This man receiveth sinners. What a testimony of Christ. The need was supplied not only by one who loved them, not only in the basis of a finished work, but the need was supplied by one who'd endless resources. Storehouses, it's in the plural. Not one store, but an immense supply of stores. And full of grain as the sand of the sea. Not one part was open, but, but all the storehouses. Immeasurable, endless supply. Think of the heavenly Joseph. He giveth and giveth and giveth again, the hymn writer said. An endless supply. It's immeasurable. And he's not impoverished by his giving to us. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. There's Paul's testimony. My God shall supply all your need. There's a precious truth. Shall supply. There's a permanent treasury according to his riches. Not out of, but according to his riches. In glory by Christ Jesus. The oligarch and the supply. Very quickly, the ordering of the supply. Now let's just think as we draw this to a conclusion. How did Jacob respond when he heard the news there was corn in Egypt? You see, the knowledge of the corn that was in Egypt was not sufficient to meet their need. They had to actually come to Egypt. They had to be willing to purchase before they could partake of the corn. Now think of Christ. You see, as I think of the ordering of the supply, three things were necessary. First, there was a confession. Old Jacob faced up the reality. We can either live or die, boys. Which is it? He knew there was a time to die. He knew one day death would come for them all. The Bible says, so does the point on the man once to die, and after this the judgment. I just thought when I heard the death of um, Lord Bally Edmund or Mr. Edward Hockey, a time to die. Those words just came into my mind when I heard the news from a brother-in-law. He phoned me from Romania to tell me that who had died in the helicopter crash. I know there was him and two pilots and another man. But I wonder, getting into the helicopter, did they think in their mind, a time to die? You know, many people never think of that. They just pretend everything's okay. But old Jacob, when the famine was there, he faced it squarely and honestly. He knew that we're staring death in the face. And he was honest before the Lord. And being honest before the Lord, there's nothing to be ashamed of. We have nothing of ourselves, no power or strength to supply our need. 
we have to make a confession. Notice there's a coming in verse 42, or chapter 42 and verse 5, we read, And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Twice. And we read in verse 6, they came and bowed down before Joseph. Took the humble place. There was reverence. Imagine if they had not been willing to come. They came directly. They came humbly. There was a coming to Christ. There has to be a coming to Christ. Not staying away. Not thinking I'll manage. Not thinking somehow I'll cope. Not thinking I'll do without. You must, sinner, if you're going to have a need met, saint, have a need met, you must get to Christ. There has to be a confession of where you're at. There has to be a coming to Christ. Notice lastly, there has to be a conversing. Look at chapter 42, verse 7. We read, And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. In other words, they converse with Joseph. This is why we've come. Do you know in World War II, there's a story told somewhere in the South Pacific, there was a bombing raid uh, by the um, American Air Force. There was a captain over that squad of pilots and uh, other personnel by the name of Johnson. And he took with them the chaplain. And they had a successful bombing raid. And uh, somehow when they returned from the successful bombing raid, of course in the midst of enemy fire, they, they plain that the chaplain was in got hit with bullets. Uh, and they had to land. And they discovered that a lot of the bullets had hit the fuselage of the plane and that they had lost their fuel and they couldn't take off again. Now the enemy hadn't seen the plane coming down or at least they hadn't appeared uh, to uh, come to where these uh, group of men were with this little plane. And then one of the soldiers, he said to the chaplain, now you've been preaching to us about trusting in God. You've been preaching about prayer. You tell us to believe and expect God to answer. Well, now you need to prove it for yourself. We're in a tight situation. We want you, we'd like you to go to prayer and ask God to help us. This man prayed, this chaplain. And you know, at two o'clock in the morning, one of the men was walking along the shore of that little island, wherever they were in the South Pacific, and his eyes spied a metal barge floating in the sea. And you know what was in that barge? This is a true story. 50 barrels of aviation fuel. And they couldn't believe it. They patched up their plane somehow. They got the fuel into the <coughs> tank and they took off from the beach and they landed safely back later than the rest at their little base. An investigation was made as to where this fuel had come from and they discovered that 600 gallons of aviation fuel had been discharged by an American cruiser with fear of being torpedoed by the Germans. And he put it into the sea about two weeks before. And there it was being washed up on the shore of that beach. It's not an amazing answer to prayer. You see, the Bible says, ask and ye shall receive. The Lord Jesus is able and willing to supply our need. Not the church. Not baptism. Not confirmation. Not church attendance. Not the good that you and I do. We're to go and ask for things. Ask for salvation. Ask for supply. Ask for help. Confession. A coming. A conversing. That's the ordering of the supply. That's the steps that we have to take. Our time is gone. The opening of the supply they came to buy. That was their intention. Do you know how much they paid for the food? Nothing. Verse 40. Or 25, and Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. In other words, it was without money and without price. And they ended up getting more than they asked for. They got food for the way. And isn't that just like the Lord Jesus? 
Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask and think. And wasn't that just a little foretaste of greater blessing from the heavenly Joseph? The openness of the supply. Come to the heavenly Joseph. Think of the origin. He has laid this by for all hungry, perishing souls. And he himself in love, on the basis of a finished work, has got an endless resource that we can tap into. But there must be a confession in our part. There must be a coming to him. There must be a conversing and an asking for him to do this for us. And if we ask, we'll receive. And it won't cost us anything. It's without money and without price. May the Lord bless these few words to our hearts this evening.